Welcome to the show. Thank you. Good I cannot start the interview without commenting on your shirt. That is a, an interesting uh, motif you have on there. Uh, is, uh, this, this actually is a shirt from the 2011-2012 protests in Russia. Well, what, is, what does that shirt mean? Putin must this not wear a princess crown? Um, <laughs> yes, uh, Russians against tiaras. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's Putin should not be a monarch. Right, We should right. have a liberal democracy. That didn't work so well. Let's, uh, let's, let's talk about that. Let's get straight into that idea. Putin should not be a monarch. Uh, do you think in many ways Putin has managed to cement his power as uh, in effect, uh, a monarch of Russia? Absolutely. There are no elections. There are no elections for you know, Congress, uh, the Russian equivalent of a Congress. Um, and there's, uh, there's a presidential election, but no one can get on the ballot without Putin's personal permission. And no one can campaign. Which seems fair. I mean, <laughs> he, you know. he thinks he's the best person for the job. <laughs> he, he, he genuinely does. He is uh, someone who for a long time has felt, though, that his standing in the world has been diminished. He's, yes. he's someone who has felt for a long time that Russia isn't where it should be in the world. Would you argue that that's all he wants uh, from America and from, from the EU and all of the pow powerful nations out there? You know, the kind of leader that he is, basically, an autocrat, uh, there, I don't think there's such a thing as all he wants. He very much wants to be taken seriously. He right. very much wants to be treated as an equal partner by the United States. Um, but he will always want more. I mean, it's, it's in the nature of that kind of leadership to, to want to expand. And it's also in the, uh, he needs to constantly sort of create the illusion of movement mm -hmm. in order to be able to mobilize the population. It's interesting that you say the illusion of movement, because you, you've written extensively about Vladimir Putin and understanding authoritarianism, looking at what it comes with and what it entails. When you look at Vladimir Putin and you look at Donald Trump, are they the same person? Are they similar? Or are there aspects of what they're doing that reminds one of the other? They're not actually that similar, right? Um, I mean, emotionally, they're completely different. Uh, Trump is raw emotion, and Putin is, he prides himself in being so controlled, right? Now, uh, and they obviously. Like Trump crying watching a movie. Like, I'm emotional. <laughs> <laughs> not exactly what I mean, but, um, uh, but, you know, they come from different histories, and everything about them is different. But there are certain things that I think are characteristic of autocrats that after 20 years of covering Putin, I've sort of trained my eyes to see that, right? Such it's like as? I, have, I have optics. Well, like for Trump and Putin, one amazing similarity is the way they lie, right? Um, which most politicians who sometimes lie will want you to come around to their point of view. They want to get you to believe something. Right. These guys lie to assert power. The more absurd what they say is, the be more power they have asserted. It's basically saying, you know, I will say whatever I want whenever I want to. It, it, I don't understand that. Is that them basically having the power to define reality? Is that what it is? I, I, I truly don't understand how they see that as a powerful thing, because you would assume everyone's looking at them going, but, but you're lying. Well, it's two things, actually. One is having the power to, to define reality, right? It's not, I'm not just president of the country, I'm king of reality. Right. But there's, it's also a bully tactic. I mean, it's like the kid who stole your lunchbox, and you're saying, you stole my lunchbox. And he's holding it, but he says, no, I didn't take your lunchbox. Huh. Right? And he has the power. That's interesting. When you, when you look at uh, Putin and Trump's relationship, um, the media has been focusing on it. You, you cannot escape it on the news in the US. Um, do you feel that this is the right amount of attention that should be paid towards it, or is there a different way to look at it? As someone who has been an expert at what the Russians want or what's happening with Russia-American relations, how do you think it should be handled as a, as a topic, as an idea? It's important, obviously, and, um, and Russian interference in the election is important, but I would argue that actually what's out in the open is much more important than whatever an investigation might, has unearthed, for, uh, at least at this point, right? Um, I mean, we saw Donald Trump say openly that he wants Russia to hack Hillary Clinton's email. Yes. Introduce it, right? And so I don't quite understand the excitement when nearly a year later, it turns out that Don Jr. said in private and confidence the exact same thing his dad said in public for all the world to hear. But right? wouldn't, you, wouldn't, wouldn't some people say, yeah, but that's different. He said it, but then he claimed that he was being sarcastic, whereas with Don Jr., it looked like this was an action. These people were willing to collude with the Russians. 
Right, but I think, again, we knew that, right? And, and I think it's important to react to what's out in the open. What's out in the open is Trump's admiration for Putin. Uh -huh. What's out in the open and Trump's, is Trump's explicit understanding that political power is what Putin does, right? It's controlling a country. It's, it's governing by decree. It's basically, again, establishing an autocracy. There, there are many people who say Putin and Trump can't be that similar because Putin is oppressive of the LGBTQ community in his country, but Donald Trump has said that he would be an ally to the very same community. Right. So I actually wrote a piece. <laughs> <laughs> I actually wrote a piece a year ago um, in which I argued that, uh, that if Trump became president, he would likely reverse progress on LGBTQ rights. And it was a weird thing to do because when I was writing it, I thought, logically, I know this to be true. Uh, emotionally, I couldn't believe it. Right? I was right, even as I wrote it, I thought, well, it's impossible. You know, it's like, it seems uh, that we have made so much progress. Right. That there's no way it can be reversed. Plus, Trump had said, you know, he had draped himself literally in the rainbow flag. Right. Um, and yet, it was it was the most recent social change. It was the most uh, it was the fastest social change. But I think even more than that, and I think this is where uh, what his what he did a year to the day after I wrote that article. Uh, with tweeting that transgender people weren't going to be allowed to, to serve in the military. What he did was something that's emotionally go that emotionally actually goes to the heart of Trumpism, which is very anti-modern. It's, it's this promise of re return to this imaginary past that is so simple that everybody's role is assigned at birth. And you know, you're born to be you know, a carpenter uh -huh. or a farmer, and, and you will live in the same quarter for the rest of your life and you are born man or woman, and it can never change, and nothing about you can change. That, I mean, it's, 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 it's an almost mystical kind of past, but it's the kind of past that, that he promised us. You know, he ran on the promise of an imaginary past. And I think emotionally sort of uh, saying to Americans, look, you're not going to have to face the possibility of inventing yourself. Right. Is very important for him. So if we're to look at Putin and Trump and their relationship as it stands, um, I believe the Senate just moved the bill forward now to the president's desk, uh, the sanctions on Russia. That seems like it's going to be a, a major point for Trump. He's going to have to openly say, yes, I am completely with the United States, or I'm going to uh, deny this, I'm going to veto this bill and, and not support the sanctions. Do we know anything about their relationship beyond what we're told in public. Is there anything that we should be looking for as someone who's familiar with the Russians and as someone who's seeing Donald Trump at the same time? Um, so again, I mean, I think that we should be looking at what's out in the open, mm -hmm. right? We should really, at all costs, try to avoid the kind of conspiracy thinking that a leader like Trump, who is himself a conspiracy theorist, produces, right? You want to mirror it and look for the hidden secret mm -hmm. instead of just staring at the truth that, uh, that, that stares you in the face. Um, but Frankly, I don't think that Putin is as interested in uh, lifting sanctions as he, as he claims to be. Oh, interesting. There's a particular set of sanctions that, um, that Russians are very interested in lifting. And those are the sanctions imposed by the Magnitsky Act. Yes. Right? Um, and that's, that's when they talk about adoption, they actually talk about those sanctions. Those sanctions are important because they target people personally, they target their assets personally, and they have really felt the pain. Right? When the country at large feels the pain, that actually uh, is not, it doesn't necessarily hurt Putin. And in a way, it's a mobilizing tool for him because Russia has been sort of gathered around Putin uh, who has said that uh, Russia is at war with America. He has been saying that for basically the last four or five years. Wow. It's a scary story and uh, the shirt that you're wearing makes it <laughs> light at the same time. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank I appreciate your mind. The future of history will be available October 3rd, but you can pre-order now. Mash your guests and everybody.